Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, Husserl ideas. So we're, we're in part one still, the, the fundamental phenomenological outlook, taking on chapter two today, the thesis of the natural standpoint and its suspension. Um, so we, we're kind of, it's maybe that that title might sound like we're we're just rehashing this idea, but we're still talking about the natural standpoint. That's kind of something that, that's taken up a significant part of both of the prior videos. Uh, and we are, we are actually. But um, I think that in this video, in this chapter, we start to really get into some of those phenomenological descriptions that... Um, the people who came after so Heidegger, Malo Ponti, Sartre, they made kind of famous. They took over and really, really ran with. Um, we kind of start seeing some of that coming through from from here, actually. So kind of the same ideas. We're, we're running over the same ideas in a little bit more detail, essentially. Uh, and so that's the first um, part of the video today: the natural standpoint. So we're originally aware of the world in our, Husserl calls, our field of intuition. Um, field there, obviously, remember uh, Malo ponties use of the word field as well, the phenomenological field, transcendental field. Um, but the field of intuition for Husserl is, is, is everything that, that we are, um, is our entire awareness of the natural world. Uh, and this is this is the case even without explicit attention or conceptual thinking, conceptualizing the world, even without doing that, even without explicitly focusing on um, all parts of the world, where we still the, the world still enters into this field of intuition. So the field of intuition is quite a broad um, way of, of describing our awareness of the world. And it include, it goes beyond what we're explicitly focusing on at any one point in time. And some of, of the, the things that he, he mentions here, we are aware of the world. This field of intuition captures the idea of, of space and time, everything happening in space and time. Again, even though we're not we may not be explicitly thinking about space and time. That's just, it's built into the world as we, as we are aware of it. Uh, it's experienced through the senses. Uh, and he talks about encountering animals and other people there as well. And all of this takes place inside this field of intuition. Uh, and where this gets quite interesting is he talks about these different levels of awareness of the world. Um, I don't think he calls them levels, actually. He doesn't, he doesn't explicitly break them down into three like I am doing here. He just kind of outlines them. Um, but but I've, I found it kind of useful to break it, break it down into these three levels. So at the first level, we have the field of perception. And this is the things... Um, that I directly perceive with my senses. So the, these are the things that I'm explicitly focusing on at any one point in time. Uh, that's the field of perception. Then the second level is what I've called the immediate background. And so this is just taking us beyond that field of beyond that field of perception. Um, and the way. Husserl describes it in the book is letting one's mind wander to unseen portions of the room, of the room behind him, um, out into the garden, you know, just these, this kind of background in which the field of perception or the things that are in the field of perception are playing out on. And he calls this a, uh, it could be distinct or indistinct, relatively, depending on, 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 our, on our focus. He calls it a distinct or indistinct co-present margin. 
Um, and that, that word's important, co-present. So it's, it's um, present with the things that I'm explicitly focusing on, the things that I'm explicitly aware of and concentrating on in that first level, in that field of perception. Um, so co-present, it's there kind of in the background. I'm not focusing on it now, but I know that everything I'm looking at is um, in this room, even though I, I can't see the whole room. And I know that this room is in, in a house, even though I'm not aware of the house explicitly as I'm focusing on the objects in, in my room. And I know that my room is in, you know, so on and so forth. You can pass it out step step back out as far as you want to go but but everything is is um that i'm that i'm experiencing in this field of perception has this co-present margin around it and that co-present margin what i'm calling the immediate background forms a continuous ring around the actual field of perception so this is it's kind of like um a background which so this is a background which we can always turn our attention to if we wish you know i, I can bring my mind to to bear on um, the kitchen which is just outside my room i can bring my mind to bear on the street in which you know on which my house is um so this this that's why i call it the immediate background it's like it it um it frames my current field of perception. And then we move to this third level, which, I, which I've called the deep background. So it doesn't give it a name. He doesn't call the second level the immediate background either. Um, but this, this third level, the deep background, taking us just another step beyond the immediate background. Um, and I'll give you a quote, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So the immediate background is a dimly apprehended depth or fringe of indeterminate reality. I can pierce it with rays from the illuminating focus of attention with varying success. Moreover, the zone of indeterminacy is infinite. The misty horizon that can never be completely outlined remains necessarily there. So what we have here, this with this deep background is um, something that, that's not even necessarily graspable. We can, we can um, pierce it with rays from our, from our focus of attention with varying success. It's not something that we can even necessarily explicitly bring into grasp. Uh, even if we want to, it's it's this nebulous kind of um, deep background which which sustains everything, which sustains that immediate background and the field of perception. It's this, it's something that it's it's just too far beyond our um, capacity to to adequately grasp, and that's there, as Earl says, it's always there. It's always there in, in every perception we have. We've got this, this core field of perception where I'm, where I'm focusing. There's an immediate background which I can turn my attention to, which frames that, that field of perception. But then there's always this, this kind of nebulous background which is it's, it's beyond our capacity to, to bring into explicit focus. Um, uh, and it's interesting that he says this, this zone of indeterminacy is infinite. So it, it's, it just extends out beyond, beyond, again, beyond our capacity to, to fully uh, apprehend, to bring it under any kind of concrete intuition. And that really reminds me of Levinas's notion of the elemental, if you've read um, totality and infinity he talks about it in there uh, and it's it's just like this this exactly the way Husserl's described this nebulous background on which everything is is built everything is is um, established but it's something that we we can't grasp out we, we can't grasp we can't bring it into 
kind of concrete focus. It's always, always on the back in the background as as something um, supportive, but but ungraspable itself. Um, and so I think we can think of these as kind of concentric spheres. Um, so you've got that, that field of perception in the middle, then there's this immediate background around it, and then this infinite, ungraspable, um, deeper background, which which sustains everything, but is is beyond our capacity to to, to properly intuit. And what's important with this is that when you shift focus, so if I shift my focus from this particular field of perception to something in the immediate background, I don't get closer to that, uh, that infinite zone of indeterminacy. That focus shifts with it, and all the zones shift with it. So wherever I turn my attention is always the field of perception. And there's always that immediate background around it and that zone of indeterminacy around that. So it's like it's the, uh, these backgrounds, that level two and level three, are always background. Then ne we, we're never able to see any, the background as background. If we turn our attention to the immediate background, that becomes the um, the field of perception, and that is ringed with another immediate background. And it's you know it's like if you try and catch the background by by moving by shifting your focus, you always only find the field of perception. That that's that's where our attention is is riveted. It's locked, uh, and ever, wherever we turn our gaze, that's what we're looking at. And so all experience, all of our perceptions, uh, all of our awareness of the world is always framed by this, um, these, these background levels. And that, that's a really important um, idea that Malo-Ponte in particular takes up and, and, and works with. And this is essentially uh, a spatial account. Right? We're, we're kind of thinking in terms of space here, thinking about the room and, and rooms outside this room and, and kind of stepping out that way in space. But the same holds for time, Husserl says. This world now present to me and in every waking now, obviously so, has its temporal horizon, infinite in both directions. It's known and unknown. It's intimately alive and it's unalive, past and future. So there's always this temporal uh, center. And that's wherever we, we are. That, that's, that's what's alive now, this present. The present is the equivalent of the spatial field of perception. And then and around it we have temporal backgrounds, which um, are, by comparison, unalive. You, and again, we could break it into um, into these levels, these, these extra levels, the second level, the immediate background, the immediate past, and perhaps the, the, um, uh, the, the, the coming future that brackets where we are now in, in the temporal present. Uh, and again, we can step beyond that to dimly perceived past and the dimly um, perceived future. But but those are still, um, they're still there. They're always there in every moment and every every experience of the present is, is framed by these temporal horizons. So that's a really important point um, and really... A classic kind of phenomenological insight. Uh, so we, we go on to talk about the world as immediate reality um, and what Husserl means here, what he talks about here is the way that the world is, is always there for me as that which necessarily precedes every experience, every thought, judgment, every act, uh, 
and of which I am a member. So that last bit's important. Actually, both of those are important. So the world is always there for me. It necessarily precedes every experience, every thought, every, anything that we do is done on the background of this world. This world is, there is no experience, there is no thought, there is no judgment, no act, nothing you do that that isn't framed by this world, that doesn't take place in this natural world, that doesn't have this natural standpoint supporting it. And of which I am a member. That's also a, a really important addition there because that that takes us beyond Cartesianism right? we're not this um, spectator subject we, we're not removed from the world looking at it as as a um, a disengaged spectator we are we, we the way that we see the world is as um, something that's always there and as something which of which I am a member. That that's that's kind of another phenomenological insight here. We are going to to make a transcendental reduction. We are going to step back, but the world itself, the natural world, is something we see in this way. This is our experience of it. This is our. This is how how um, we are aware of the world as something which always presupposes everything we do and as something in which something of which I am always a member. I never I'm I'm never aware of myself as this kind of removed, detached onlooker. I'm always I'm if 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 we think about our, our actual awareness of the world, it's always an awareness from within it. It's, it's never from this removed position. We're always engaged in the world. And this means that therefore this world is not there for me as a mere world of facts and affairs, but with the same immediacy as a world of values, a world of goods, a practical world. And that, that obviously should bring to mind Heidegger all the way. Um, values and practicalities. Things appear, as Earl says, as beautiful or ugly, agreeable or disagreeable, pleasant or unpleasant. We don't get this um, sterile picture of an object first and then import these values or import these uses on, onto it. The thing appears as a good thing as a useful thing, as a pleasant thing, or an unpleasant thing. It, these, um, these values, these norms, the uses are built into the object itself. They're not, they're not secondary additions. Uh, so he, he talks about things appear as, as objects to be used. The table is something to put my glass on. The piano is something to be played. That's how these things manifest for us. That's how they appear. People and animals appear as friends or foes, as strangers, as dangerous. They don't appear as um, kind of neutral objects first and then as someone, as a friend or as, as an enemy. They immediately appear appear as friends or enemies. It's just a part of what it is. It's, it's, it's kind of a silly way to put it, but it's kind of built into the object itself, to the thing itself. It already comes with these values, with these norms, with these um, uses for us. So really, like I said, really Heideggerian. Obviously Heidegger's Husserlian, but, um, but this, this is kind of really the, the the point that Heidegger picks up on and goes and and runs with in a completely different direction to Husserl. And this is why Husserl complained about Heidegger that he never got out of the natural standpoint. 
because we're, we're discussing the world from the natural standpoint, right? We're still in the natural world here. Um, and that this is where kind of Heidegger stayed. And so Husserl criticized Heidegger's being in time when he read it as, as you know, he never got outside this natural perspective, this natural standpoint, um, which is a fair criticism. Um, but is it a criticism or, or did, it, did, did Heidegger actually do something? Um, is there value in what he did? I would argue the, the latter, but, um, but either way, this is, this is kind of, this is good phenomenology here. This is, this is really kind of meaty stuff. Um, so world, the world is immediate reality. And then we move into this idea of still talking about the natural world, but he, he brings the phrase, the Kagito so it starts talking about that, that kind of that Cartesian word, right? The Kagito for Husserl, this, this is a word that describes our conscious relating to the natural world, to the natural world immediately given to us. So that involves, includes all kinds of um, conscious activities, presupposing, inferring, describing, comparing, any kind of conscious activity is um, in which we relate to the natural world in this way is what Husserl means when he talks about the Kagito. Um, but then he goes on to say that we're not always occupied with the natural world. We're not always occupied in this in this kind of um, in this relation, this kind of cogito relation to the natural world. And the example he gives is the arithmetical world. So he talks about when we're focused on arithmetic, uh, which is not concerned with the natural world. We, we've, you know, this is something purely. Um, mathematical but he talks about the difference between the two and this is is interesting and instructive as well the arithmetical world is there for me only when and so long as i occupy the arithmetical standpoint but the natural world the world in the ordinary sense of the word is constantly there for me so long as i live naturally and look in its direction i am then at the natural standpoint and so again, we have that idea, the natural world is always there. It's, it's ever present, even when we turn away from it, even when we direct our attention to the world of pure mathematics. The world is still there. The natural world is, is still there in the background. But the arithmetic world is not always there in the same way. When, I, when I'm focused on the natural world, when I'm perceiving, when I'm um, engaged with, with my sense experience, um, the arithmetical world is nowhere to be seen. I'm not, I'm not it, it, it doesn't frame my perceptual experience. It's not a part of it at all. Uh, but, but when I turn to the arithmetical world, the natural world is still there for me. I haven't left it behind. It's, it's a fundamental feature of of what it is to be a human being it's always present even when it's it's a dimly perceived background or even not perceived at all we may not even be consciously aware of it at all but it's still there it still makes up the background on which all of our activity including our conscious activity um, plays out on and he goes on to talk briefly about other people. Uh, he just says, as a part of this natural world, I experience other people as ego subjects like myself, related to a natural world, which is the same as mine. So again, we're, we're not trying to ascertain truth or whether this is, is real or, or anything like that, just looking at our awareness of the natural world, what it is to be, to look at the world from this natural standpoint. And so that's how we experience other people as, as ego subjects like myself related to a natural world, 
which is the same as mine. This is just a description of, of our, um, our regular everyday position. And this leads to all of, all of what we've talked about leads to what Husserl calls the general thesis of the natural standpoint. And the general thesis is that the world is always there for me as a fact world existing out there. So this is, this is just how the world appears to me, even when I'm not explicitly articulating it in any way, even when I'm not, not concentrating on what the world is, even when I'm just living my life, even when I'm focusing on, on philosophy or math or whatever, this is, this is how the world appears to me. It, it's always there as a fact world, as a world of facts, a world of made up of individual concrete um, objects existing in space and time, all of, all of that, what, we, what we've talked about in, in the last, in all of the videos leading up to this. That's how the world appears to me, as existing out there, something separate from me, external to me. Uh, that's just, that, that is how the world appears. That's what the world is to us. And even doubting and rejecting all the data from the natural world still leaves the natural world itself intact. There's always this, this um, all of your actions, all of your judgments, all of your experiences take place in this natural world. So, even, so that, and that includes rejecting the natural world. Re rejection is, is a kind of conscious position towards something. It's a judgment. Um, so is doubting. That, that, that's another conscious attitude you can take. But, but it, we've already said the, natural, uh, the general thesis, the world is always there for us. It's always, it always appears as a fact world existing out there. And, and even the denial of it can never go all the way because it couldn't take place without this natural world already there. Everything presupposes it. Anything we do, anything we think presupposes this, this natural standpoint. So what about things like illusions or hallucinations? Can't we be wrong about things? Of course we can. But then Husserl says these, these must be struck out right? when, we, when we recognize an illusion or we recognize something as a perception, as a hallucination. We strike them out. But out of what? Out of the natural world. It's always, the, the illusion is always replaced by something real. It's never replaced by a void of nothingness, right? It's always replaced by something that we think is, is actually there instead of what we mistakenly believed to have been there before. And so that whatever replaces it is the natural world. It's a part of the natural world. Same with hallucinations. Hallucination doesn't even make sense without... The, the um, prior presupposition that there's something to, there is a reality, there is a real truth to something beyond the hallucination. Um, so everything, everything we do, it's just, it's this always present presupposition for human life, for human existence. The goal of, of natural science is then is to know this natural world, this world which is always out there, always present, to know it ever more perfectly, to, to strip away these illusions and, and hallucinations and get to um, what this, this natural world is um, in itself, beyond, beyond any illusions or um, incorrect perceptions we might have of it. And that's the job of, of the natural sciences, to investigate this world. We're not going to do that. We're going to follow Husserl into the next section, the phenomenological epoche. So where we start with this is, um, he, he 
Hassel starts by talking about Descartes and and uh, and 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 his doubt, his doubting method. Um, but whereas Descartes looked to doubt everything and see what was left, Husserl's going to say that um, we can't, we've already seen, we can't doubt everything. So he, he says uh, what, what he's going to do is attempt to doubt. He's talking about the attempt at doubting, not an actual doubt. We're not actually doubting the natural world. When we perform this epoche, we're not actually we're not actually trying to reject the natural world. That's impossible, right? That that's the general thesis. It's always there. It, it must be. There is no getting around that. So what we're going to do is this attempt at doubting. So that means that the doubt for Husserl, rather than trying to uncover something fundamentally true is just a divisive method. We can attempt to doubt anything and everything, however convinced we may be concerning what we doubt, even though the evidence which seals our assurance is completely adequate. So even though we know, we have no doubt, we have no doubt that um, the natural world is the, is is for us the way it is, and it's always there th this way. Um, even though we have absolutely no doubts concerning that, we can attempt to doubt it, um, and that will let us focus on 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 what Husserl really wants to focus on: this turn to essences. Um, but but we're not really doubting the world we're, because it's it's undoubtable. It's um, we can't. Husserl's already made that clear. We can't doubt it. So we can, nevertheless, we can attempt to doubt it as a divisive method. That's what he calls it. Divisive method to get us to something different. To give us this. To open up a new sphere of inquiry for us. Uh, and that's going to be essential science. So we can't doubt the being, capital B, being of anything. Because of the natural thesis, it already presupposes being. Um, and so he, he says this, what he's doing is an, is an attempt to doubt being of some form or other. That's what all doubt is. It's an attempt to doubt being of some form or other, but not doubting the form of being itself. We can never, we can never completely doubt uh, the world because it's, I've already said it a thousand times, it's already there. It's always already there. So what we're doing then with this attempt at doubting is, um, what, the, what the attempt to doubt is, is a suspension of the thesis. And that's a really important word, suspension of the thesis, not the postulation of its antithesis. We do not abandon the thesis we have adopted. We make no change in our conviction, and yet the thesis undergoes a modification. Whilst remaining in itself what it is, we set it, as it were, out of action. We disconnect it, bracket it. The thesis is experienced as lived, but we make no use of it. So I, I really wanted to just focus there on those words modification and bracketing. The thesis is not denied. We don't deny the world. We don't reject the world. We don't even doubt seriously the world. We don't abandon the thesis. All we do is modify it. We bracket it. We put it aside. We pay no attention to it. Um, and that's because so it, it seems like you know what, so what's the point of this if we're not actually if we, we're just pretending that it's not it's not it's not there or it's it's not useful what's the point the point is that this opens up for Husserl a new scientific domain 
gives us access to this um, previously unimagined realm of essences. Uh, and, and if we don't make this bracketing, if we don't suspend the natural world, we, we never, we're never aware of this essential science which, which underlies it, which underwrites it, which makes it possible. So the, the attempt to doubt the suspension of the thesis is in order to discover this new scientific domain. I do not then deny this world as though I were a sophist. I do not doubt that it is there as though I were a skeptic. But I use the phenomenological epoche, which completely bars me from using any judgment that concerns spatio-temporal existence. So that, that's just kind of, I mean, I, I really like that quote because I love that sophist skeptic um, uh, addition there. I don't deny it as though I were a sophist. I don't doubt it as though I were a skeptic. Those, those are, uh, I just, I feel like I could definitely use that in, in different situations, but that, that line, just switch out, deny this world, switch, put, add in, you know, something kind of sophistical that you've, uh, that you've read. I don't X as if I were a sophist. I love that little expression. Um, but the, the epoche then it's not, as opposed to a, a denying of the world, it just turns us away from it. We, we, we don't make use of any of the, um, judgments that apply that, that, that we, we glean from that natural world, that world of spatio-temporal existence. And, uh, and that will take us into essential science. Just one thing to note there as well with the end of that quote, spatio-temporal existence, the word that, that is there, the German word in, in Husserl is Dasein. And just worth noting, um, not to confuse that with Heidegger's Dasein. Um, uh, although, I mean, that, essentially they're talking about the same thing, spatio-temporal existence, but for Husserl, that's what we're moving away from. We're turning away from that, that realm. But for Heidegger, that's exactly where we're going. That's the realm that he wants to focus on. That's the realm um, in which everything happens for him. So that, that really, it, that, that single quote, kind of um, captures the difference between Husserl and Heidegger. The one is, um, yeah, stuck's not the right word. The one is, is completely focused on that Dasein, spatio-temporal existence. And the other is trying to step back from it, to turn away from it, to find out to, to this deeper essential realm, which he thinks will ground that that the Dasein, the spatio-temporal existence, um, but yeah, an interesting an interesting um, point to note. Just keeping that the, the 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 difference between those two in mind, even though it might be tempting to try and, and you know see Dasein. Aha, there's there's Heidegger. That that is Heidegger, but Husserl is going away in a different direction. All right, so let's hit a summary. So first we looked at the natural standpoint. Um, we talked about those three levels of awareness, the field of perception, then what I called the immediate background and the deep background, and how those are, we can think of those as concentric circles. And wherever we direct our gaze, we're always in the middle of that, of those three concentric circles. Um, then we looked at the world as an immediate reality. So immediately appearing for us with so objects immediately appear for us with values, practicalities, with these kinds of things um, suffused within them. We don't we don't see objects empty. We don't see empty objects first, and then and then bring in um, values and norms and practicalities and, and impose them on them. That's they appear for us with 
these kinds of, of uh, with these, um, see, I, I can't, can't even talk about it as, as an addition because they're not additions. They appear as already the things that they appear to us as, um, if that makes sense to you. And then we, we kind of wrap that section up with the general thesis, which is that the world is always there for me as a fact world existing out there. Not making kind of any objective claim or anything there, just describing the way the world always appears to us. And it appears to us as always, always there, ever present, and as a fact world com uh, constituted by objects in space and time, concrete individual objects, and so on and so forth. All the, all the things that make up um, facts, that fact world that we talked about, I think, two videos back. Uh, the second section of the video was the phenomenological epoche, and this is essentially the attempt at doubting the world. Focus on the word attempt there. We're not, we're not actually doubting the world. We're just, well, that's the, the next section. We're bracketing or suspending the natural world. We're, we're just turning away from it, setting it aside, um, in order to uncover this, this deeper um, eidetic realm that uh, Husserl wants to move into. Alrighty, so that's this chapter. Um, this was a good one. There was some, some really interesting phenomenological um, insights came through here, I think. Uh, so anyway, thanks for sticking with me through it, and I'll catch you in the next video.